All right, so welcome back. We got some extra space if anyone wants to spread out. Um, slight more of an echo in here than normal, you know? But that's good. It gives everyone an ex extended opportunity to talk and contribute to the lesson. I think that'll be good. But welcome back. We had a week off, unfortunately. My bad. Sorry about that. Um, but okay, so since it's been two weeks, um, last week we had, uh, last week we were talking about Paul's second missionary journey, and we got through like 60% of it, something like that. Uh, we talked about Paul and Barnabas having their fight. We talked about the odd thing with circumcising Timothy and what, what was going on there. Uh, we talked about the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and we talked a bit about an exorcism of a girl with a demon and the whole idea of why Christianity was objectionable to the Romans under Roman law. So we did cover a lot last week, even though we didn't get all the way through the lesson. So tonight we're going to hopefully finish up Paul's second missionary journey and ideally Paul's third missionary journey, admittedly in an abridged format. Um, Luke does get a little travel loggy, if that makes sense, with the third missionary journey where it's, we went to, yeah, no, it's a word. You can look it up. It's a, good for Scrabble and everything. Um, you know, it just kind of gets to a point where sometimes it's like, oh, we, we sailed here and then we had to go here, take a train here, bus here, and now we're in Antioch again, you, you know, that kind of thing. So, and then there's some important stuff that we do need to hit, hopefully. But that's the goal for tonight, to finish up the rest of his second missionary journey, some highlights of his third missionary journey, and there should be some interesting stuff to talk about with all of that. So that's our goal for tonight, and why don't we open up in prayer and get started. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone who was able to make it. I just thank you that, uh, I just pray that you would be with us in a special way during this study. Pray you would be with us in the reading of your word, in the discussion, and I pray that you would open our eyes to some aspect of your word uh, and of your spirit in how you would want us to live and operate and just understand who you are and what your mission is in this world. So I pray you'd be with us during this time. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so even though we are going to be finishing up Lesson 10, why don't we start at Lesson 11 and backtrack. Uh, once again, I need someone to read the opening paragraph of Getting Started, as I do not have it in my book. <laughs> I think we're all familiar with that story. The fancy televangelist asking for money as they are in extremely expensive suits, praying for the third jet that they need for the ministry. You know, it is what it is. You know, sometimes you need to get around in style. Um, question one, how do you respond when you hear, hear a wealthy television evangelist plead for people to support their ministry? <laughs> Change the channel, all right. You ever give, has anyone been like really tempted to, to donate to one of these ministries? No? <laughs> yeah, we just need to get pastor on TV. That's, that's the ticket, yeah. We'll get air conditioning in this building yet, yeah. Okay, um, question two, what, what do you conclude about their character? Manipulation. Manipulation, yeah. Wonder about their 
Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so a question I have in my book is how do you know when someone is full of himself? I think this kind of like this could apply to to one of the preachers, it could apply to, you know, possibly some people you know. What would kind of give you that impression that someone was full of themselves? What does that mean to you? Lack of humility? Okay. An interest in money for a third jet. Yeah. Like really, if you want to support a village that is destined for something or, you know, mm-hmm. or, or ministry. Or but how are you going to get to that village yeah, without yeah. the third jet? <laughs> the second jet? Mm. Okay. Okay. So we're good with two jets. <laughs> Three is pushing it. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In the sense that they're like, you know, selling the word that, um, that they're promising that like, giving them money is going to get you something that you can't get anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a, your ministry is that unique that, yeah, okay. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. A prayer tower. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Huh. That's why our church is built on a hill. Most people don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Jerusalem's on a hill. Green Ridge is on a hill. You know, it's just how it is. Okay. So we understand this concept. We understand this unfortunate. We all have someone in our heads or even a facsimile, a a compilation of people in our heads with this type of thing. But we're going to look at the Apostle Paul because we're hopefully going to get to many things tonight, but I think one of the big things that we end up seeing, especially in the third missionary journey, is the character of Paul. Like, we kind of see what he's doing all throughout, but assuming we get to the end, we really get to see his heart for the people that he's ministering to. And you probably know some other things about Paul outside of the book of Acts that kind of tell you that he's not in this vein. But we should be able to see some interesting things. So, okay. Open with me. I will be straight with you. We are not going to be in the book tonight. I have all my notes in the book. We're basically just going to be in the Bible and talking. Um, so, why don't you turn with me to Acts 16. We're going to pick up right where we left off two weeks ago with... In case you don't recall exactly where we left off two weeks ago, Paul cast the demon out of that one girl. There has this whole riot thing because it, they're teaching things that are unlawful for the Romans, you know, basically following gods other than the Roman gods. And as per usual, Paul ends up in prison. Okay, so Acts 16, starting verse 23. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. 
Ah, we'll keep going. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Uh, then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So let's just stick with that for now. We won't get fully into the story of the Philippian jailer. But I know we're kind of jumping right in with this, but because we're like mid-story where we left off two weeks ago. But what, do you, what did you see in that text? What jumps out at you that you thought was interesting? What's that? The earthquake. Okay. All of them, right? Maybe you'd understand Paul and Silas, like, because uh, I guess even that's strange. But yeah, all of them, they're all still there. Yeah. Yeah. With a sword. That's a tough way to go. Um. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to hit on specifically. Okay, so you're Paul and Silas. You were just beaten, flogged, uh, not flogged, that's extreme. No, they were just, uh, were they, yeah, first, oh no, they, okay, so they were whipped, beaten a little bit, you know, just for good measure, thrown in prison. How do you end up praying and uh, praising God, singing songs in that situation. Like, what does that even look like? What does that, how does that work? Are they happy? Are they, like... Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. So they're crazy is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's the thing. Do you think they're singing and praising God because they're already really excited about their situation? Or is that... I know how I would be in the event that I ever got to that point. Like, okay, let's assume that I can easily get whipped and beaten and thrown in prison. Cool, that's done. Assuming I ever got to the point of, like, singing and praising God in the middle of a prison... I'd have to imagine it wasn't because I was psyched about it, but because I made a distinct choice to do that, right? Maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think gets you there? Like... Yeah. It has to be a mindset, but also it has to be commitment devotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think again, 
we have a situation where the early church looks like Jesus. They're getting beaten, they're getting whipped, and then you don't have a lot of singing from Jesus on the cross. You do have a lot of prayer and like he's quoting Psalms. Um, but then even the idea of, okay, when we count, when Paul counts suffering for Christ joy, it's because he, they, the early church considers themselves partaking in the suffering of Christ for them, you know? So it's, it's kind of this like, like they understand that they're mirroring Jesus in those things. Um, okay, so we won't read the rest of the story. The Philippian jailer and his family do get saved. So yeah, Paul and Silas had quite a big impact on them. Because um, it, it's actually interesting that the jailer ends up letting at least them go, and he like he fixes their wounds and all that. Um, he was ready to kill himself because he thought the prisoners escaped, and then he's further like he knows he's risking his life by allowing them to leave afterwards. So yeah, there, there's quite a big impact there. Um, okay. Now, something that won't require nearly the amount of discussion. After they leave Philippi, they're traveling around and jump to chapter 17. Okay, so they were in Thessalonia, and 17 verse 10. Uh, then the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who were coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Those were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Okay, that's a weird little passage. They were just in Thessalonica, and they preached the gospel, and people were psyched. They accepted it readily. They're saved. It, it's fantastic. Paul and Silas have a good ministry there until their lives are threatened. They get sent to Berea. And Luke makes an interesting note that he considers the people in Berea more noble because they heard the word of Paul as the word of God and then searched the scriptures diligently to basically check his work, to check, make sure that his message was accurate and lined up with the scripture that was already in place. Um, it's not something we have to discuss in detail, but I think it at least gives us a bit of encouragement and license that, like, one, it's probably not a bad idea to check up and make sure what you're hearing taught and preached is actually in the Bible. Um, maybe a healthy skepticism is not the worst thing in the world, especially when you're, like, when you're, just, when you're dealing with almost anything but spiritual things. Um, you can't necessarily just take what you hear and roll with it, and that's fine. Um, and if your teacher or preacher can't take, like, oh, hey, I was reading this, and I, I don't know quite how this lined up, and they can't really take any sort of questioning, that's probably a bad sign. Um, if you think, especially people who have gone to church most of their lives, yeah. so we all have sermons that we have here, where the pastor will explain when you have a question about what someone else is speaking, are they speaking, you know, some people who see, they use truth in their mingling. Yeah. So, Yeah. Uh, so it's a pretty good example, really, like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and it kind of, um, there's a lot of churches, a lot of different religions where they're not encouraged at all to bring a lot of mm -hmm. So churches like our faiths, so to speak, they encourage it. They, you know, look at what I'm saying. 
Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, there's even um, I forget the exact name. The it's like the Berean Institute. Is that all it is? The, the Berean Institute. It's like um, that might not be the right name, but there are institutes like seminaries or just apologetics ministries that are that base themselves off of like the example of this church like hey we're going to diligently study the scriptures look at these things and um, yeah so a church mentioned for a single verse in acts like people latch on to because it's a really important principle um, yeah okay carrying on with the story so paul keeps traveling he gets split up from Silas and Timothy for a bit, and he finds himself in Athens. So what I'm going to read to you, we're, we're going to look at chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 14. I have 20 verses to read. It is mostly a sermon from Paul that you may have heard before, but I just want to read it in its entirety, and then I'll let you guys talk about it for a bit. All right, 17 verse 14. Um, yeah, and then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timothy abode there still. They're still back at Berea. And they conducted, uh, they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a, command, a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the, whole, the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, uh, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areo, uh, Areopagus Areopagus, that's where the emphasis goes. Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with, the ins uh, with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are, all, uh, for we are also his offspring." For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead." When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named uh, Damaris and others with them. So, long section of verses. A lot there. What jumped out at you? And I remembered I need to get something. Carry on. What jumped out at you? What about it? That Paul was saying that it was actually God. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Athens seem to be different How so? It comes up a little more philosophical. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he didn't get beaten. That's a plus. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he was upset about it. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else jump out at you or anything you didn't understand? A lot of new names, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 When it's interesting, some of the names that get thrown in, like the last verse of the chapter, you get the names of two people who believed, and then, like, and others with them. And you're like, well, who are those people? We don't hear from those people again. Like, well, why are they there? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, okay. So, okay, he was on Mars Hill. So I think a lot of times we picture this as just a hill, and it was called Mars Hill, like he's just doing some open-air preaching. So he was at the Areopagus, which is on Mars Hill, and it's basically a, like, so whenever he has to go to the, before the Sanhedrin in Judea, this is almost the same idea. And this was actually a kind of high-stakes event, like he could have gotten beaten at the end of this. Um, because we aren't familiar with ancient Athens, we don't quite realize that, like, this was actually a pretty stressful event for Paul, most likely. Um, so he would have been before, like, Athenian elders, and some of them are philosophers and Epicureans and Stoics. And um, So, yeah, he's, he's really trying to give his best persuasive argument here. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because cause that's the thing. Even though we think of, like, the philosophers, you know, what, I don't know what you think of the Greek philosophers, but, like, Socrates was put to death by the Greek state for his ideas. So, like, even the philosophers don't have free reign. They still have to be within the realm of the state religion, even if they have some different ideas on it. Um, so th they're, they're sort of free to think and philosophize and speculate, but if you're caught, if you're accused of, like, undermining the fabric of their society, you're still in trouble. So this was a weird situation. Um, but yeah, it's filled with philosophers. It's almost like a caricature of the city, the way, the way Luke puts it. Uh, but I did come across something interesting and I think very helpful for the unknown god. Because, again, we have this idea that maybe, you know, they worshipped their normal pantheon, but maybe they were like, ah, maybe there's this one god we don't know about, we'll just make an altar. Sort of, but not quite. So there's more going on here. Okay, so I found this online. Um, so it says here, in this, in this sermon or response, Paul uses the poet's words to introduce, uh, to introduce the Greeks to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he mentions two Greek poets in this.
Yeah, cool. Okay. Paul uses the poet's words to introduce the Greeks to the death and resurrection of to the true God, Jesus Christ. The historical account, so he, he quotes two different people, uh, Epimenides and someone, it's a very, I like it. I think we're going to focus on Epimenides, but I, yeah, no, yeah, that sounds right. Um, sorry, it's a very long, very long article. Um, okay. So in the 6th century BC, when the poet Epimenides lived, there was a plague which went all throughout Greece. The Greeks thought that they must have offended one of their gods, so they began offering sacrifices on altars to all their various false gods. When nothing worked, they figured there must be a god who they didn't know about whom they must somehow appease. So Epimenides came up with a plan. He released hungry sheep into the countryside and instructed men to follow the sheep and see where they would lie down. He believed that since hungry sheep would not naturally lie down but continue to graze, if the sheep were to lie down, it would be a sign from God that this place was sacred, naturally. At each spot where the sheep uh, tired and laid down, the Athenians built an altar and sacrificed the sheep on it. Afterwards, it is believed the plague stopped, which they attributed to this unknown god accepting the sacrifice. So it's sort of, it's probably stranger than what you originally thought of this superstitious unknown god, but there's a whole story behind it. And um, uh, there's another thing on the other poet, but we'll stick with that for now. Okay, so Paul is using things that he expects his highly educated Greek audience to know. He's dealing with philosophers and uh, very educated people. Did you see much of a gospel presentation in what he said? Or do you notice differences in how he presented it compared to anywhere else? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and what like what is he not focusing on specifically that he may have earlier? Jesus isn't in it much, which is interesting. But also he's not spending any time with the Jewish scriptures. What well, they're they're Greek. You know, um, he's not saying back when, as you all know, our father Abraham, and then he's not going from there. He's going from a place that the Greeks will actually understand. He's actually using some of their own poets to make really complex points. But then from what I see, we got to be careful here, because what I don't want people to take away, and I don't think anyone here will, is like... Oh, if your audience isn't, doesn't really know the Bible that well, don't worry about it. Just talk about other stuff. It's all good. That's obviously not the message here. Because in verse, so uh, back, backing up to verse 18, he was clearly preaching to them Jesus and the resurrection, which is why he goes to the Areopagus. But in the proper dialogue or monologue, Verse 26, we have the idea of all people are of one race, which is an interesting claim that the Greeks probably wouldn't have readily believed. Verse 30, all those people of one race need to repent. 31, judgment is coming. And he has a resurrect, judgment by Christ and a resurrection. So it doesn't sound Jewish at all but he still gives you all people need to repent 
because Jesus is going to judge the world, and this was established by God because of the resurrection. So it sounds weird, and it sounds much different than the very Jewish gospel he was preaching earlier on, but Paul clearly knows what he's doing. And, like, who pulls out quotes from ancient Greek poets? Like, he's, he's just doing this off the top of his head. His, his education was clearly even more broad than we would think for a Pharisee, you know. It's quite a thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, that look. And it could be because, as, you were, as we were saying earlier, like he's being given an audience. Uh, one, he's not angry with the Jewish people for the crucifixion or in rejecting their own Messiah. Um, he's not talking about, even though they worship false gods, they're not Israel worshiping false gods. And he even kind of says God, like, in the past, God, it says, KJV says it, God winked at those things. Like, he kind of, like, like, you know, he's not destroying them, but it's like, uh, okay, it, that was the situation because they weren't the chosen people of God. They weren't Israel. So God wasn't bringing down fire and brimstone for that, you know, for people who aren't Israel, not worshiping the God of Israel. But then, yeah, no, it, it's a much different presentation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, and more people were willing to hear him again, and yeah. I think it just proves that you know, we approach witnessing in several different variations. Yeah. Several different styles. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Be able to mm hmm. Know your audience. Know your audience. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. he impressed some Athenian philosophers, so he's got to be up there, you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to chapter... We're running out of time again, as per usual deciding where we should go. All right, we got 15 minutes. Let's go to chapter 19. Okay, so I will tell you that we passed over an interesting couplet of events where Paul runs into people who were disciples of John the Baptist, but not Jesus. They clearly heard the message of John the Baptist, were baptized, and then out of the area before the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection took place. Uh, one of them is Apollos, who, or Apollos, who is a very prominent early church figure. And then some of the others are just unnamed people, and they have to hear about the Messiah who did come, and it's a whole event. But okay. Chapter 19. Verse 11, and I, I guess we'll end with this, basically. And it came to pass that while Apollo... Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 11, yeah. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body uh, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, 
and diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, uh, a Jew, and chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. All right. Yes, quite a little horror novel that goes on there. Um, Opening thoughts, questions, concerns, befuddlements. It's an interesting story. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, just like the miracle of a bad dream. Yeah. Um, it's just sometimes people don't think about when we believe in God and Jesus that this is a supernatural thing that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting that he knew, <laughs> like he knew who the bosses were technically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting passage. Any uh, any other thoughts or questions or? Yeah, Skiva, I go with yeah. So they are Jewish exorcists who say, basically, I'm casting you out in the name of Jesus, who Paul talks about. So they they don't, yeah, they're not not Christians. They don't know Jesus. It's that guy Paul talks about, that, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and what we... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting right from the start that apparently you have this class of what the KJV calls vagabond Jews who are exorcists. So you have this, it, these particular seven sons of someone named whoever Skiva is who seem to have an itinerant exorcism ministry. 
Okay, that's what they do. They seem to go from place to place exercising demons. I'm sure they get paid for it. It gives you every indication that up until this point, they probably had success, right? Because you, you can either take the idea of like, none of that's real and they're complete scam artists. I don't see any evidence of that in the text and I don't think the ancient world thought in those terms at all. Not that there aren't scam artists in the ancient world. But there's clearly stuff that they were doing that they were able to cast out evil spirits on a regular basis without the name of Jesus, which shouldn't, I think it's a surprising thing if you haven't given it a lot of thought, but even in Jesus' ministry, Pharisees say, hey, you're casting out devils by the power of the prince of devils, by Beelzebub. And he says, well, if, if I am casting out demons by the power of the devil, by what power do your sons cast out demons? He says things like that. So obviously implying Jesus is not the first person to ever cast out a demon on the world stage. Don't know exactly what's going on there. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, because we know even from the ministry of the apostles that that doesn't, like, it doesn't always work. Even the apostles preaching in the name of Jesus at a certain point, there is a demon that they cannot cast out, and Jesus has an explanation for that about things about prayer and fasting, and um, basically they, need, they weren't, like, spiritually strong enough. That might not be the right phrase, spiritually strong enough, but... Jesus was able to do something in that realm that they could not do, and he gave them the reasons why he thought why he why they couldn't do it. Um, so it doesn't mean they would have been able to do that in this particular instance, but I think their odds would have been better. You know, like it, it's funny. It's almost like the, the the demon is offended by this concept. Like, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so they have the name of Christ, but not the power of Christ. And that's important because, yeah, it's... And you know what? Uh, what we didn't read, part of this name of Christ being magnified in this area, part of what breaks out is like this anti-occult revival that kind of happens because I... You know, I don't know enough about the history of the town that they're in, if there's some major cultic centers or what's going on. But basically, there are all sorts of people all over the city after hearing this who repent of, in our day, we would just call it like some sort of witchcraft. And they have tomes of things that they all basically pile into the town square and burn. So it's almost like, this almost feels like it's operating on like a, like a magic level where it's like, Oh, you think you can say the magic words? You can just talk about this Jesus guy, and that's what does it. But, like, over and over, what we see is that they only have any authority in this space because they have the Holy Spirit in them and because they belong to Christ and God, and that it's His power. It's not just some name, it's not just some magic abracadabra type thing going on. And then, of course, you're confronted with the startling fact that we already briefly mentioned that demons know something, right? Like, it's probably a little silly to imagine them having, like, staff meetings in the morning, you know? But whatever demon is involved here, they, okay, they obviously know Jesus, and that, that makes a lot of sense to me, okay? They know who Jesus is, and they know who Paul is, so his name is getting around, which is interesting, and I don't know what that means and I don't know how that works and it's a it's a baffling little concept um, I don't like I don't know any thoughts questions uh, that I probably can't answer oh sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah, most likely. I mean, yeah, a couple of verses before, 
Paul is, uh, you know, God's doing some really interesting stuff through Paul. Like he's, you got the whole handkerchief thing going on. If you've heard of that in modern days, that's where it comes from. And while looking at the book of Acts, you have to go, well, I guess it's possible. If you're not the Apostle Paul, I have questions, (laughs) you know. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's a bargain. You you should get two, they're small, you know. Um, Yeah, so... Yeah, so I don't know exactly what's going on there with, like, do demons talk to each other? Like, I don't know. I don't know what that means. And then, yeah, go ahead. Also, like, uh, it's in scripture that Satan can appear as an angel of light, mm-hmm. and it's known that he does know scripture. Right. And the demons, I would think, would be, you know, mm-hmm. out of him harming each other, mm-hmm. and they're able to do things, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something happened. You're not going to believe this, boss. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Were you going to say something? Oh, I was just, and Ron, not that you would, but I know one of Ron's specialties is the book of Revelation. And at the end, when there's a battle, sure. and Jesus comes down, and, well, so Satan and his demons are the army, I'm guessing. Sure, depends on what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, okay. But I just, to me, it's just, if I'm correct in what I'm saying right now, it seems to me that, like, yeah, they're organized. Yeah. So they Yeah, even in the ministry of... Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something we're not quite privy to. Um, because to me it seems like this... Um, they're so... I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. They, they, they seem much more coherent than, like, you do have demons speaking a few times in the New Testament. Um, you have the whole, like, I am legion exchange with Jesus, like, you know, a couple things. Um, yeah, it's one of the more coherent conversations that you kind of get from them. Because even when they say, like, yeah, but who are you? It doesn't, it, it depends on what they mean. Like, Maybe they literally, like, oh, well, I know Jesus, I know Paul, I don't know you, as in, like, literally. Or, like, you ever, you know, someone's messing with you, like, who are you? Like, you know, so, like, someone tells you what to do when they have no authority to, and you're like, who, who are you? Like, who do you think you are, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very creepy scenario. Um, So we didn't get to like some super important things. And um, it will have to be okay. Uh, So we have two weeks. Uh, So yeah, that was the decision since originally back when we started, whatever month we started this, this was going to be the last week. And then we pushed it back a week from one week off that we had and then since we had another week off, we'll just do it again. It'll still get us out at the very end of May. So should be all right. Hopefully it doesn't keep getting hotter. We'll see what happens. Um, 
But yeah, an interesting lesson, kind of strange and sporadic, albeit, I, I admit. Um, but yeah, we do see a bit of the character of Paul. If we, we will definitely get to, the thing that I wanted to get to that really addresses his character is him talking with the Ephesian elders after ministering in Ephesus for a few years. There's a long exchange as he's leaving them that is a really pointed statement about Paul's mission, his character, his conduct with these people and how he ministered to them. And you see how they feel about him after all this time. And it's, just, it's like a really humanizing thing for, for the Apostle Paul. So we'll definitely get to that next week. I think going forward, so for the next two weeks, I mean, we talked a lot tonight, you know. It's not like it was just monologue tonight. Over the next couple weeks, I think we'll probably do just as much, if not more, talking. Because I do want to get into even some of what we hinted at tonight of like, what does witnessing look like? You know, Paul's message looked different with the Jews than with these Greek philosophers and you know, if, if what we're getting ultimately from the book of Acts is the spread of the church and the resurrection of Christ and how that spreads, we should spend some time discussing that on the ground in real world terms and, and what that looks like, what that can look like, what that does or doesn't have to look like. So, yeah, that's what we'll be doing for the next couple of weeks. We'll finish out the main points of the book and discuss hopefully how that applies on the ground. So any, uh, any last comments, questions, thoughts, concerns? Okay, let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the study of your word. I thank you that uh, we were able to look at some stuff that we've probably never considered in all that much depth, uh, just some different odd and fascinating and ultimately stories that magnify you in one way or another. Uh, we thank you for the history of the early church written down for us uh, so we can understand about who you are, what you're doing in the world uh, back then and for today. So I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time of study. I pray you would be with us and bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.